Ji, assalamu alaikum. Good uh, afternoon. My name is Bilal Anwar, and um, I'm the Chief Executive Officer for uh, National Disaster Risk Management Fund. Uh, based here in Pakistan, Islamabad, I know we have some international uh, participants, so for the sake of our international guests, um, just wanted to just want to introduce that we are based in Pakistan. First of all, thank you very much. Wonderful. We are uh, seeing an overwhelming response and um, uh, apologies, uh, many, many apologies, deep apologies for those people who have not been able to join because we have already exceeded the capacity of uh, our, our participants. Um, just a few words and we are still waiting for uh, the Secretary, Ministry of Planning, uh, to deliver the opening remarks on behalf of Mr. Asan Iqbal, Federal Minister for Planning and Development and Deputy Chairman, uh, Planning uh, Commission of Pakistan, who was supposed to deliver the opening remarks, but then he has to go to uh, another meeting in the Prime Minister's Secretariat. So he has sent his uh, regrets and... Uh, um, you know, while we are waiting for Secretary Saab, just to give you a little uh, background and information about NDRMF. Well, first of all, this is the first ever webinar being held uh, by the by the National Disaster Risk Management Fund, and it's uh, of course uh, uh, a complete delight to see that so many number of people have actually come and they have. Uh, uh, participated in this uh, in this webinar. So NDRMF, most of you would know that, but some of it might be new for some of you, is, um, is, a, is a government established fund, uh, exclusively established for the uh, making Pakistan resilience against the against natural disasters. Um, we know that, you know, in Pakistan, Pakistan is one of the fifth vulnerable country in the world when it comes to climate change and impacts and disasters. And uh, we have a rich, rich and unfortunate history of disasters and that uh, the people and the communities and the economy has been suffering uh, uh, with a number of climate induced uh, disasters. So this particular fund was established back in 2016 uh, with, the, with the mandate and the goal to uh, provide the financial support uh, and the funding for the interventions and the projects and the programs which uh, reduces the um, risk for natural disasters. Uh, the fund has been very, very active in the last three, four years, and uh, it has a rich portfolio of projects all over Pakistan. And uh, the typical areas in which the fund has been investing and supporting has been uh, uh, disaster risk reduction, flood protection, uh, drought, um, similarly rescue, uh, fire services, and uh, uh, now recently we have a, a big climate change uh, portfolio coming up uh, as well, uh, in which we are uh, uh, supporting and we're going to support in uh, forestry, uh, fisheries, ecosystem restoration, um, sustainable transportation, a number of other measures like uh, like this. So um, we're enjoying a we're enjoying a very um, a favorable uh, response and support from our donors, uh, mainly Asian Drama Bank, as well as the World Bank, and similarly, small uh, other grants money, which came from a uh, Norwegian uh, funding agency, AFD, and uh, a number of other, uh, other donors, multilateral and bilateral donors. Um, so uh, a considerable amount of experience and uh, expertise has been developed uh, and gained in, uh, in, the, in the National Disaster Risk Management Fund. And we are actually looking forward to uh, uh, go into the next phase of our operations, which is actually starting uh, early next year, uh, January 2023. And we are uh, actively and diligently working, coming up with a portfolio which is more tuned and synchronized with the more recent and emerging threats of uh, climate change uh, to, to, to Pakistan. Now, talking about climate change and talking about disasters, and uh, as you know that this uh, particular webinar has been focused and structured around the, the uh, IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, very recent report, which came back in February. And um, I think that report uh, tells a lot uh, uh, in terms of uh, what we're going to face uh, uh, in terms of the adverse impacts of climate change and disasters. Um, there are a number of, uh, number of areas which uh, has been highlighted in the report, and uh, our speakers are going to be talking a lot more in scientific uh, uh, findings uh, in their interventions, but just to highlight that um, what the report basically says that 
uh, all the scenarios which have been uh, charted out in the report, they basically, uh, the, the portray a very grim picture and a very, uh, um, I would say that uh, threatening picture when it comes to the impacts of the climate change. Uh, we are already passing through 1.5 degrees centigrade. Uh, the, that's, that's what the, the, the increase in average temperature of the world is, is facing through. And um, um, at 1.1, .1, sorry. And then uh, the, the target for Paris Agreement, which is 1.5 degrees centigrade. So the scenarios basically show that it's very hard and it's, uh, uh, to, to achieve that target. Uh, even with 1.5 degrees centigrade, if that is achieved, uh, we know that and um, we know that uh, there is going to be uh, a number of uh, adverse impacts and irreversible impacts. So the world is going to be seeing and uh, experiencing a lot of disasters and similarly other uh, other kind of threats as well. So some of the key elements, see, key messages from this particular report uh, include that the climate impacts are already widespread and, and as swear than expected. Uh, we know that we are locked in uh, even worse impact from climate change in the near term. term. Uh, we all are passing through it and you know there are so many visible signs which are uh, not ignorable. Uh, the risks are uh, going to be escalating quickly uh, in the form of higher temperatures and uh, a number of other uh, irreversible impacts. Uh, um, I think the one key element, one key message which emerges out of this report is that um, the window of opportunity on climate action, especially when it comes to the adaptation measures, is closing very, very fast. You know, some people are saying that we have actually gone past the age of adaptation. And uh, so uh, we, live in a, we live in a very gloomy uh, kind of a situation right now. And uh, all the forecasts and estimates are showing that it's going to become even more starker in the in the coming decades. When we look into look into into Pakistan, I think the the situation is even more uh, even more critical and serious. You know, Pakistan is the fifth most vulnerable country, and um, you might have seen the live video and the coverage of uh, the glacier outburst. Uh, a flood uh, not uh, a few weeks ago and the collapse of bridge in uh, Hasnabad in Gilgit Baltistan. And similarly, uh, uh, in the last Five, four or five weeks time, we have seen, uh, we're passing through the, the second heat wave and there's one heat wave in which we are passing through right now. Um, all all uh, estimates, all forecasts are basically telling us that this is going to become even more serious and critical. So this is a scenario, this is a situation in which we are. And uh, so the, this series of webinars, which is five webinars, and this is the very first one, our goal and mandate and the mission is that to highlight some of these issues from a scientific perspective, as well as to look into the adaptation measures. So I have an excellent um, uh, lineup of speakers and thank you very much to all of you uh, for coming together and uh, sparing your time. I know you all are very, very busy people and you are working on multiple tasks at the same time, but thank you very much. And uh, we very much look forward to hear from all of you. Um, I think uh, Sakti Saab uh, is, uh, might be a little delayed. So what we do is we actually switch and we start off with our very first speaker. Uh, I'm very pleased, a dear friend, uh, Mr. Fahad Saeed, who's a regional lead South Asia and Middle East climate analytics based in, uh, in Germany. He is in uh, subsidiary body section right now, which is going on in Bonn. Uh, Fahad has done an, um, um, he's done an uh, excellent uh, uh, research work, and some of his top, some of his research articles uh, really check out and really uh, highlight some of the some of the issues which we are going to talk uh, today. So Fahad is going to talk about uh, increasing ambition science update from the latest IPCC report. Um, Fahad, thank you very much, and uh, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bilal. So uh, I'm just waiting for the permission to share my screen and I have got the permission. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so uh, let me let me first of all congratulate uh, NDRMF and uh, and the CEO, Mr. Bilal Enver, for having their first webinar on this very critical uh, issue of very critical importance, which is which is science of climate change. And uh, I haven't seen a lot of uh, media um, uh, covering covering this uh, particular report. So these uh, IPCC reports actually are uh, considered as bible of of climate change because they they all come with consensus. Okay, let me dive into into my presentation, and uh, I've orchestrated my 
uh, slides in a way that I will give you uh, a little uh, in-depth uh, introduction of what IPCC is and why it is important in the global policy making of related to climate change. And then uh, I think the next speaker would uh, talk more in terms of its application uh, or the messages which are relevant for Pakistan uh, from uh, those IPCC reports, especially the Working Group 2 report. So, <clears throat> okay, so first of all, uh, so the IPCC uh, is a leading international body of assessment of climate change, it was created in 1988, uh, uh, by you, the World Meteorological uh, Organization and United Nations Environment uh, Protection. And it has 195 member countries. Uh, so the task, so, uh, the task of uh, IPCC is to assess, uh, I'm just reading it because the, those are very uh, well-defined tasks of IPCC set in stone that they, they have to assess on a comprehensive, ob objective, open and transparent basis, the scientific, technical and socioeconomic information relevant uh, for the, uh, to the understanding uh, of human induced climate change, its potential impacts and option for adaptation and mitigation. This is a very important message that IPCC reports have to be neutral with respect to policy. They cannot be policy perspective, although they can uh, give uh, uh some objective uh, uh options uh for the which are relevant for the policies uh it is not only uh valuable for uh, uh for unf triple c but it is uh, um, it is also very important for governments academia ngos private sector and other organization so the ipcc and the unf triple c uh what ipcc does is that it reviews and assesses latest scientific information. So the, the, the bulk of the information carries an IPCC report is uh, based on peer-reviewed research, although it also looks in uh, other reports uh, and findings, but the, uh, but the main source of information is the, uh, for IPCC is peer-reviewed literature, which is published in different scientific journals. And very important to note is that it, IPCC does not uh, conduct its own research. Rather, it depends on, on, the, on the information, although it assesses the data and produces the plots as well, but it's not, it does not conduct its own original research. It has the advantage over other uh, uh, literature because uh, uh, all the countries and the governments uh, get a chance to uh, to review and provide few, uh, feedbacks, not only, only the countries and governments, but also uh, the scientists from the, uh, from the field of climate change. So the process is set in a way that they get a chance to comment or, uh, or criticize or, uh, uh, the, the, the report at, at the stage when it is being developed. And all the reports are government approved. Uh, so, just to give you a background that I already in the la last slide mentioned that the IPCC was created in 1988 and the UNFCCC was created in 1992. So, it, uh, IPCC published its first report in 1990 and uh, based on the finding, finding of that report, UNFCCC was created. So, you, ha you hear a lot about UNFCCC, but the very creation of UNFCCC can be attributed to, to IPCC. And the next IPCC report came in 1995. It resulted in the in the uh, uh, Kyoto Protocol in 1997. The fifth report of IPCC came out in 2013, and it resulted in uh, uh, the Paris Agreement. And the, specifically, the 1.5 temperature limit in Paris Agreement is because of the IPCC report, which came out at a very appropriate time. Otherwise, if you go uh, to in 2010, there were not a lot of talk about. Uh, uh, 1.5 degrees centigrade, but the report came out in 2013 and there was a process of periodic re review which was set up and then countries realized, the, the, uh, of the member countries of UNEP, C they realized that 1.5 degrees centigrade is the critical limit and uh, going beyond that would put, put us, uh, put many uh, countries and communities into uh, uh, existential threat. So th that is the some some of the background of the uh, of the importance of uh, IPCC in the UNFCCC process. 
So uh, the publication of IPCC, the, uh, it uh, comprises of three major types of report, which we call as assessment, assessment report. So there are three volumes, separate volumes together with the summary of policymaker, as well as the fourth one is the synthesis report of all these three uh, volumes. The first one, working group one report is called physical science spaces, working group two impacts adaptation and vulnerability and working group three is mitigation uh, report. So these are the reports from the last uh, IPCC cycle called AR5 assessment report five. So you can th uh, see three uh, reports of the working groups as well as the synthesis report on the right of history. Besides uh, uh, the assessment report, IPCC also publishes uh, special reports. Um, we, I mean, uh, most of you are aware of this famous 1.5 degree centigrade special report. So in the, for the case of special report, all the three working groups, they come together, they collaborate and, uh, and they produce uh, consolidated message related to the, to the specific top, topic. And uh, it also has a summary for policymakers. And uh, on top of that, it also IPCC publishes a methodology report. Uh, for example, in, in the last uh, IPCC cycle, it published a practical guideline for preparation of greenhouse gas inventories. So uh, yeah, so six assessment, assessment cycle, there have been like these, uh, there are three special reports, 1.5 warming report, uh, land report, and the cryosphere, uh, ocean and cryosphere report as well as the refinement, uh, 2019 refinement of the 2006 IPCC guidelines. And then there, there is a big process of six assessment reports as uh, Bilal, uh, Mr. Bilal Anwar has mentioned that uh, three reports of the working group, one, two, and three are already out and synthesis report is gonna come out uh, in September this year and then it will complete the sixth assessment cy cycle of the IPCC and then we, from the next year, we'll go into the a seventh assessment cycle. Okay, so the process of IPCC report is a very comprehensive process. Uh, you can also say it is a, it's a quite a cumbersome as, as you see on, on, on this screen. So it starts with the scoping and the outline. The panel approved the outline. I hope you can see my cursor as well. So the nom then the uh, uh, nomination of authors uh, uh, comes in, in the process where the governments and observ observer organization nominate experts as authors. Then the, the, there is also a Bureau of IPCC, which also selects the author. And uh, for the selection of the author, there are a lot, uh, there are a few measures which needs to be ensured. For example, there has to be a, a balanced representation of the uh, authors from developed and developing countries, and also the gender balance needs to be ensured. And uh, then the uh, once the authors are selected, uh, the, uh, they produce first order draft based on the literature and the outline uh they uh, produce the first order draft and the next step the government and experts when i say experts they can be any uh experts from the from the field of climate change they uh, they get a chance to uh, to comment on the findings of the first uh, order draft uh, to further beef it up or to cut it down or, or if there are mistakes they point out and then ipcc uh, produces the second order draft of the report and uh, in the next step, IPCC uh, uh, comes up uh, with final draft report as well as the summary for policymakers. And uh, then the process of uh, government uh, review of final draft of SPM takes place where governments once again, uh, 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 this time only the governments and not the experts. Uh, they give the comments on the SPM, uh, summary for policymaker and then it goes into a approval in the approval process of uh, spm uh, the parties sit together in a plenary and they go line by line through all the, through the, the whole summary for policymaker report and that's why it gets an advantage over other literature because this is a report which comes out with a consensus of the whole world and uh, there's a publication of report. Uh, I've already talked about it. I'll just skip in the interest of time. Okay, let, uh, now, now I come to the content. Now I come to the importance, once again, the importance of IPCC report and the Glasgow Pact. As we all know that in 2021, we have this uh, Glasgow Pact based on the, uh, the agreement, Paris agree agreement. We had, uh, uh, we had in, uh, uh, in Glasgow. 
and here in the glasgow pack we we have certain references to uh, to work uh, to ipcc so here you can see in the signs of emergency in 1 cp uh, 26 we have a reference to interpanel government of climate change uh, in the adaptation sec section they are all, uh, already uh, re referring to uh, working group 1 and uh, and now uh, for shemush the next cop I, both the IPCC reports are out and the synthesis report will also come out. So we expect far more uh, attention which will be paid to the findings of the IPCC report. Okay, now, uh, now uh, the messages from the IPCC report. So the IPCC report, uh, th th these are the messages from the working group two report which confirms that the 1.5 limit agreed in Paris is still within reach. So that is very important to know that uh, you, um, some of you might uh, hear something uh, in the media regarding that we have already surpassed or we are committed to go beyond 1.5 degrees centigrade, but the IPCC report confirms that the, the limit is uh, uh, still within reach, but it will require deep and sustained emission reduction at the global level in not only carbon dioxide, but other CO2, uh, other greenhouse gases like methane, nitrous dioxide, and others. And uh, we have to achieve net zero by 2050. And every one tenth of a degree matters. Limiting warming uh, to 1.5 degrees centigrade would strongly reduce climate risk. For example, from the IPCC Working Group 2 report, we know that at 2 degrees centigrade, global warming and above the magnitude of the change in drought and heavy and mean precipitation increase compared to those at 1.5 degrees centigrade. For Pakistan, we, uh, as Mr. Bilal has already said, that we are currently at 1.1 degree centigrade as compared to the pre-industrial world. And at 1.1 degree centigrade, we are facing uh, devastating impacts of uh, climate extremes. For example, the heat wave we already had uh, in this month and in 2015 uh, heat wave in Karachi, You, uh, I think you will all... Uh, Remember that it resulted in the death, so the limits of it adaptation are already been surpassed at 1.5, 1 degree centigrade, and you can imagine that what could happen at 1.5 degree centigrade. And if we go beyond 1.5 degree centigrade, it means that it would even be uh, more, uh, uh, you know, devastating for the for the country. So these are the burning embers diagram, as, uh, as we call them. So I'll just take a moment to explain it to them. So uh, IPCC has uh, 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 comes up with, with this uh, kind of a figure where they have uh, different impacts are divided into different uh, categories. Uh, so we call them reason for concerns. We have five reasons for concerns. So only thing which you can see here that going from 1.5 degrees centigrade to 2 degrees centigrade you can see the risk and impacts uh, the severity of the risk and impact it changes for example for unique and threatened system uh, at 1.5 degrees centigrade you have this reddish color where it goes to uh, which is high uh, risk uh, but at 2 degrees centigrade changes to uh, to purple which is very high Similarly, here you can see uh, extreme weather events changing from red to purple. Uh, uh, distribution of impacts changing to uh, moderate towards high. So, I mean, you can see that uh, curtailing the temperature to 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, comes up with a reduction of risks and impact, which is uh, the finding of the working group, group two report. Uh, so uh, the, the, the headline messages uh, would be that the uh, climate resilient development will be severely limited above 1.5 degrees centigrade because the impacts are linked with the climate res uh, with the uh, development. All impacts will be high to very high at 2 degrees centigrade and only temporarily shoot uh, overshooting 1.5 degrees centigrade will cause additional risk. So uh, overshooting is an interesting uh, aspect of the working group two reports so overshooting means that okay we have a, a, a temperature limit of 1.5 degrees centigrade but if temperatures goes above 1.5 degrees centigrade let let's say to 1.6 degree or 1.7 and if world uh, carry out some mitigation um, uh, uh, mitigation take some mitigation measures or introduce some carbon dioxide removal technologies and we again will bring back to 1.5 degrees centigrade but the time they will uh, the temperature would remain above 1.5 degrees centigrade 
uh, it can um, uh, it can uh, trigger some irreversible uh, losses such as uh, losses of ecosystem loss and for our region is very important that glaciers we have if if they melted because, uh, because of that overshoot they are not going to bring uh, um, uh, you know they're not going to come back so that is very important for our, for a country like pakistan the the concept of overshoot and the climate change is already causing a wide, widespread loss and damage. Loss and damage is a very contentious issue, even at the, sub, the sub, subsidiary body session, which is going uh, taking place in Bonn right now. Ha half of the world's population is living in hotspots of high vulnerability. And the uh, adaptation has progressed a little, but the uh, uh, working group to acknowledges that there's a big gap which still exists between what is done and what is needed. And uh, the finding of the report is lo loss and damage would be con uh, considerably reduced uh, if we take near-term actions to limit warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. And the limits to adaptation, which is also uh, closely linked with the loss and damage, are already being reached. Uh, as I uh, uh, said before, 2015 heat wave in Karachi, it is, uh, um, it is the example of uh, that uh, uh, some people who are acclimatized to this kind of a heat, they could not survive that, that heat wave in 2015. And, but if you go at 1.5 degrees centigrade or even beyond, it's, it's gonna get worse. The science is clear once again, that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a positive uh, news, optimistic news that the 1.5 degrees centigrade is still within reach. <clears throat> Working group three report uh, did a comprehensive assessment and almost 100 uh, 1.5 degrees centigrade scenario are assessed and uh, several IMPs, which are illustrative mitigation uh, uh, pathways, and they uh, uh, figure out that the 1.5, and with different mitigation option, different pathways, and they figure out that 1.5 degrees centigrade is still within reach. And, but it also acknowledges that currently we are not on track. The current policies, which are uh, uh, present in the world is uh, taking us at, uh, towards 3.2 degrees centigrade by the end of uh, 20, uh, current century. And there's a big emission gap which is still there in 2030 between NDCs and limiting warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. This decade is very important because if we want to align ourselves to 1.5 degrees centigrade by the end of the century, we need to cut down our emission to 50% uh, uh, less than the 2010 level. <clears throat> And uh, for that reason, we have to peak immediately and half, as I said, that we have to half uh, the, uh, our emissions to, uh, uh, by, uh, by uh, 2030 to limit warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. <coughs> Excuse me. And there are options available now. Again, a good news, the options are available at the moment. Uh, so, yeah, so, okay, I, I'll skip this slide, but if there would be interest, I'll, I'll come back to the slide if, uh, and, and answers if you have any questions regarding this. Okay, so these are the, uh, the good news, is these are the options, and as you can see, so uh, in the above panel, you can see uh, the, the cost uh, of the Fahad, can you hear us? For some technological glitch, uh, just give uh, 30 seconds. Is it still online? Yes. No. No. Okay, um, participants, we temporarily lost Fahad and uh, just give him just give him uh, 30 seconds. I'm sure that he's he's trying to uh, rejoin. Lal can I be heard? 
Ji, uh, what we can do is, Secretary Saab, uh, Secretary Ministry of Planning, Development and Special Init Initiatives is online. Secretary Saab, you can, uh, in the meantime, maybe you can uh, uh, give your thoughts. Thank you, Amaji. Uh, so kind of you, and uh, uh, I uh, appreciate all the participants uh, that uh, we have come together for such an important occasion. And I've just joined you uh, because it was the minister who was to make the opening remarks, but as you understand, uh, we are always living in interesting times, and those interesting times for us are now the PSDP and the revival of a number of initiatives that had somehow stalled in the last one or two years. So the Mrs. Saab has gone out uh, with the Prime Minister for a very important uh, SEZ project, and uh, I was in the PSDP uh, still finalizing details and talking to a number of important uh, parliamentary members. So, but this is a very important uh, occasion, today's webinar. So I've just uh, come straight from there for a short while to join and just um, uh, frankly buck you up for a good cause. So let me uh, read uh, the opening remarks, although the webinar is already open, uh, but which will uh, just give you that extra spur that the minister wanted himself to present. So uh, with that uh, brief, of the record kind of uh, remarks, uh, but wishes also. I will present the opening remarks on behalf of the Minister for Planning to the honorable members and participants of the webinar. Uh, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you and thank you for participating in this very important webinar pertaining to the findings of IPCC Climate Change Report 2022 and also appreciate our team of NDRMF for the facilitation and for organizing it. We are aware of the fact that human-induced climate change, including more frequent and intense extreme events, has caused widespread adverse impacts and related losses and damages to nature and people beyond natural climate variability. The rise in weather and climate extremes has led to some irreversible impacts as natural and human systems are pushed beyond their ability to adapt. In a way, we have been told that age for adaptation is past passing. Similarly, the IPCC report 2022 indicates, and uh, this is um, uh, uh, from the excerpts that were shared by the, our team, that global warming reaching 1.5 degrees centigrade in the near term would cause unavoidable increases in multiple climate hazards and present multiple risks to our ecosystems and the humans. The level of risk will depend on concurrent near-term trends in vulnerability, exposure, level of socioeconomic development and adaptation. Near-term actions that limit global warming to close to 1.5 degrees centigrade would substantially reduce projected losses and damages related to climate change in human systems and ecosystems compared to higher warming levels, but cannot eliminate them at all. The findings of the report also highlighted the widespread pervasive impacts to ecosystems, people, settlements, and infrastructure that have resulted from observed increases in the frequency and intensity of climate and weather extremes. All of us, which we are seeing that, including the hot extremes on land and in the ocean, heavy precipitation in some parts of the world, drought and fire weather in other parts. Pakistan is fifth most vulnerable country in the world and we are already paying a very high price of climatic changes and impacts. And this also we are witnessing this year. There's a very uh, different kind of pattern of rain and extreme hot weather and maybe later as predicted, we are going to receive heavy rain, so a lot of changes and impacting us. The report also indicates following climate change risks in the region, which may have serious implications for Pakistan as well. The urban infrastructure damage and impacts on human well-being and health due to flooding, especially in coastal cities and the settlements. Biodiversity loss and habitat shifts, as well as associated disruptions in dependent human systems across freshwater land and ocean ecosystems. 
more frequent extensive coral bleaching and a subsequent coral mortality induced by ocean warming and acidification, sea level rise, marine heat waves, and resource extraction. Threats to food and water security due to increased temperature extremes, and we are really witness to that. Rainfall variability, I just mentioned, and drought, which are also phenomena right before us. Keeping in view the findings of the report and Pakistan's climate change vulnerability profile, it is important for us to timely prepare ourselves, both at policy level, as well as for timely implementation of the climate change related interventions. By doing so, we may reduce the negative impacts of climate change. Today's webinar is providing all of us a good opportunity and platform to, to, uh, to continue the discussions on this very important issue and come up with suggestions and follow-up actions. I'm confident that our organization, NDRMF being of one important uh, pair, will take forward the valuable suggestions and come up with good bankable projects and interventions. I take the opportunity to commend the efforts and interventions of our team for organizing today's event and also uh, whatever start we have made in the last few years. But I see a much longer journey, a much more intense efforts that is required. The government also has uh, taken very seriously uh, the climate change uh, vulnerability aspects and uh, the, the requirement to uh, adaptation as well as disaster risk reduction and all the various facets of uh, climate change uh, which is affecting us. So uh, a number of measures are coming up. We, like I mentioned, were in the midst of the PSDP. And uh, one important uh, major policy shift was, and which is maybe a continuous one, but greater emphasis is this greater uh, recourse to spending uh, resources on water sector. So because if we are conserving uh, water, conserving water, uh, not only uh, we are catering for our food security, we are catering for our water security, and of course, it helps us in um, all the disasters that may come up uh, on one side with drought and on the other side with extreme floods. It is helping us preserve biodiversity in those areas. So it's a multiple kind of uh, initiative. So water has received one of the highest resources uh, this year. So that is a very good policy change. Afforestation and uh, such kind of measures that have been already there in place and uh, we have continued that. And of course, then there are uh, various uh, policy measures and investments both at the federal level and the provincial level in the uh, ADPs and the PSDPs where a lot of funds are coming. But funds is one aspect, the awareness and taking more concrete measures and having a policy direction overall uh, from the government from the other stakeholders, from the civil society, that is a very key element. And I think today's webinar is a step in that direction. So again, I thank all the participants and I wish you well to have a very fruitful discussion and we see very good results at the end of the day. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Secretary Saab, and uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Saab as well. Uh, we fully understand his commitments and has uh, not been able to join us today. And um, uh, it's, it's important to know that he underscores and underlines the importance of, uh, of today's webinar. Uh, we were going through a very interesting uh, presentation from, uh, from Fahad Saeed. Uh, due to technological issues, he dropped out, but I think we are ready to reconnect. Fahad, if you can... Um, um, take over the charge, and then also I may request to speed up a little bit as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you, and I apologize for not being able to continue with my presentation. As I understand, there was uh, some glitch on, on my end. So I'll start. I, I hope that you have seen this slide when I was presenting that was uh, uh, calling for climate action, that the current policies which are in place are taking us to 3.2 degrees centigrade and to align ourselves uh, to 1.5 degrees centigrade, we need to peak uh, the emissions immediately and half uh, them to uh, 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 cut the emission, emission to half 
by 2030 to uh, limit warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. And the good news is that there are options available. So when I, uh, uh, I logged off, I was on this slide where it was uh, uh, highlighting the renewables, different options of renewables like wind, onshore wind, photovoltaics, and solar power is dropping uh, from 2000, uh, to, to 2020 quite considerably. And the adopt, adoption of these technologies is going up. Uh, and the, you can see a clear trend there. For example, some numbers here, the cost of, uh, for example, solar energy has fallen by 85%. Similarly, wind, wind energy by 55% and batteries by 85% when you compare it with the prices of uh, 2010. Uh, and that, uh, uh, so uh, in order to close the emission gap, so that is the very important figure. So the, all the blues you can see here in, in, the, in this plot, uh, they, it mentions that the cost of the options with the blue, shown by blue, are lower than the reference. So which means that, for example, for wind energy, uh, two uh, gigaton of CO2 by year can be uh, reduced if we adopt uh, wind energy and if we eliminate the barriers uh, for the adoption of uh, wind energy, so it will reduce the emission by more than two gigaton CO2 uh, equivalent per year. Uh, which is less than the, uh, the, the, the reference energy, uh, the, the cost we are paying at present, uh, which is mainly based on fossil fuel. So the Tucson emission gap can be closed with mitigation options costing US dollar less than 100 or less uh, per ton of CO2 equivalent. And half of this potential is made up of options costing less than $20. So half of the, uh, the emissions can be reduced, uh, which are shown here by blue and yellow, if we, uh, uh, which is less than US uh, $20 per year. And uh, the, uh, this is what we have to do to reach net zero is to limit warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. CO2 emissions need to reach net zero by 2050 and GAG emissions by 2070 in line with the article force of the Paris Agreement. We need to cut, cut out the fossil fuel uh, uh, and we need to uh, accelerate the pace to cut out the fossil fuel co cost. Coal, must, coal use must fall uh, by between uh, 67 to 82 uh, percent by 2030. Global coal use, coal use has to effectively stop by 2050 across all sectors and with the power sector taking the lead and has to be accompanied by a steep decline in the use of oil as well as gas. So gas, we cannot, uh, the, the assessment says, we cannot take gas as a transition fuel, but we need to get rid of gas as soon as possible. And uh, to achieve this, we must remove the fossil fuel subsidies, which is very critical to reduce global GHG emissions by up to 10% uh, by 2030. Uh, okay, so in order to get this, we need to shift the trillions. Finance of fossil fuels needs to be stopped. Uh, and uh, uh, and the, uh, the report says that the overwhelming majority of the climate finance is going to uh, mitigation for, for a country like Pakistan. We need to adapt. We need to see the trillions going towards adaptation as well. Sufficient global capital and liquidity uh, to close gaps are available, the, uh, the report has said. And uh, it's the, the, the gaps are largest in the developing country. Investment uh, for mitigation investment uh, must be uh, increased to uh, three to six times um, uh, greater than today. Uh, increased financial resources for developed to developed countries need to, uh, uh, need to um, uh, align themselves uh, and as well as their access are, are very essential. So this is my last slide and I, I, I stop here. And I apologize once again for the glitch. Many thanks, Fahad. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, this wonderful presentation. So what we are hearing is, uh, um, you know, in the given scenario, the way this is the, the, you know, the way the societies are organized and the way the lifestyles are organized, you know, we are very clearly on a path from 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade uh, within this century. And uh, even in case of uh, overshooting, uh, is going to we're going to result into we're going to result into into a devastating effect. Some uh, and if uh, if nothing is done, uh, so we're talking about three point two degrees centigrade. This is kind of unthinkable, unimaginable in terms of the disasters and the impacts it's going to have. 
present you the good news as well. Uh, USD $20 for the half of the emission cards. I think this is very uh, much doable and achievable. Uh, but when we scale it up to the global emissions and the global ambition level, I think uh, the picture changes uh, a little bit. And uh, as you said, the trillions need to be shifted, um, which is an uphill task. So uh, moving on from very hardcore science and pure science and going uh, further a little bit deeper into what does it mean for a country like Pakistan or developing countries. So we have uh, um, Mr. Shabazz uh, Mahmood, who's head of climatology and environment global change impact study center, which is one of the research body under the Ministry of Climate Change here in Pakistan, uh, who's going to be presenting IPCC fund findings so glaciers are receding and thermal is thawing. <coughs> and what we see that increase in sea level for this region, for Asia is already faster than the globe. This has already been observed and this rising trend will continue in the future. And I should say at the Everyone is requested to mute themselves. So, Shabazz, up carry on. Okay. Uh, can you see the next? Uh, so, I, I, I don't know where this. So, so I think no. This graph, uh, I hope uh, you can see the second graph now. This graph shows summary of contents in direction of projected change in climate impact levels in various regions of uh, Asia. And what I would like you to focus on the second last row of this graph. And what you can see <laughs> here is that uh, the colors, the Blue color shows uh, uh, it is higher in increase, and white as the red color here shows the. It is, can you hear me? Uh, I was. Uh, so we are hearing you. Please carry on. Okay, okay. So, so, so the first four. If you focus on first four columns, they are related to temperature extremes. There is high confidence in increase in mean temperature, extreme heat, and decrease in cold extremes in South Asia. And it means occurrence of frequent extreme heat waves. This has already been detected in the observed data as well. Uh, that you can see the, uh, the spots, the circles that are put over there. Yes. The next shows precipitation, uh, which is uh, related to climate uh, impact drivers, high confidence in increase in floods, while medium in riverine floods and landslides and there is high confidence. If you look at the CIDs related to snow and ice, there is high confidence in decreasing snow, glacier, ice sheet, and permafrost. And the decrease has already been observed in case of permafrost. Similarly, high confidence for increase in relative sea level rise, coastal flood, coastal erosion, coastal heat wave, and ocean acidity. So now I move on to my next slide. Oh, and now here, uh, now I will move uh, to the IPCC impact report, uh, which was released early this year, and which is the main uh, focus of our uh, discussion today. And here we can see uh, what are the impacts. I, I would focus on the impacts on South Asia. And what we see for specifically for South Asia is that we will have severe water security challenges for international transport rivers. We have food security and energy security threats, increase in vector-borne, bottom-borne diseases, loss of biodiversity and habitat, and above all, and of course, the enhanced glacier melting and glob events in the HK region. And above all, the rapid urbanization in our region that is exacerbating the climate change impacts. And we are know, we know that we are rapidly urbanizing society. And if we look at the next graph, here we can see the observed impacts in Asia with attributed climate impact drivers. But we see that 
Surface temperature has increased in the past century all over Asia. Elevation dependent warming is observed in high mountain Asia. This is an overall trend of decreasing glacier mass in high mountain Asia. Temperature increase is causing strong, more frequent and long heat waves uh, in the South Asia and East Asia region. So I quickly move on to the next slide here. What would see the, what are the projected impacts on our food system? So what we see here that I would uh, request you to focus on uh, fourth, last and the third last column, which is related to the rice and wheat yields for uh, rice for South Asia and wheat yield for Bangladesh, India and Pakistan. So what we see is that 5% decrease in rice yield by 2040 is projected. And in case of wheat, 5 to 10% decrease in yield, percentage yield by 2040 is projected. And now what is happening here that urbanization, what urbanization is doing that it is exacerbating the climate change impacts that we are all uh, already facing. And now the figure that I'm showing you right now, This figure will describe briefly the reason why we should be concerned about our uh, metropolitan cities. Uh, wait for a second. I think it's not popping out. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's taking a bit longer. But you, uh, okay. Shabasa, okay, okay, you can carry on. You can carry okay, on. Okay. I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, what the next figure which will which may come out in uh, after. Uh, a few seconds. What I have tried to show is that the cities, they are becoming the hotspots of uh, global warming. And the, uh, we know that the, the, due to heat island effect, the cities temperatures are usually warmer than the surroundings due to their heat trapping characteristics. And what are those heat trapping characteristics of cities? Simply we have the buildings, density, their height, the layout plan of the cities, it's how densely populated it is. Then we have heating, domestic heating, industrial heating, and then the materials, construction materials used in constructing buildings and roads like concrete. So all these materials, they have a heat retaining ability. So what they do, they further add to the already heating uh, urban environment. And so these have an impact on, a cool warming impact on the uh, urban uh, centers. And however, we have we can have certain interventions where we can have cooling effect, like we can have, we can urban forest and then we can have vegetation, which can have a cooling effect. And if you have water bodies like lakes or oceans, then they can have a cooling effect on the urban environment. And, but at the same time, I think the outcome, the key message uh, from this uh, slide is that we need to focus on urban forestry if we want our uh, so our uh, urban centers uh, to be cooler uh, in the future and have less impact or are less impacted by the climate uh, change. So this next graph, it shows the assessed changes in water and consequent impacts. If you look at this graph, it provides regional synthesis of assessed changes in water and consequent impacts. Yellow color shows projected, whereas the blue color shows the observed uh, changes. And upward arrow shows that there is an increase in physical impact, while downward arrow shows a decrease in physical impact. And in case of human systems, uh, the positive shows increase and the negative shows uh, decrease. And the color, as I told, 
yellow is for projected and blue is for the observed. And if we see this graph a bit closely and we focus on the second column, which is related to the Asia, which is related to our region, what we see that human systems mostly are mostly likely impacted, both in present and future. So same is the case with the physical system. In physical systems, we see that precipitation and riverine flooding, they are going to increase. And this is with the high level of confidence. The darkness of the color shows the level of the confidence. Now I would move uh, quickly to the risks, risks related to the climate change in Asia. Climate change related risks are projected to increase progressively at 1.5 degree 2.5 degree and 3 degree of global warming in many parts of Asia. Heat stress and water deficit are affecting human health and food security. So what we see that risks due to rain, extreme rainfall, sea level rise, they are exacerbating. Extreme rainfall events are increasing in South Asia. And in the future warming scenario, what will happen that it will cause more frequent temperature extremes and heat waves. Uh, especially in the dense, densely populated South Asian cities. So these are the key risks involved. And, and, and I move to the next slide. I think it would take a bit time due to some international problem. But uh, in the next slide, what I am trying to show is that the adaptation related strategies in Asian agriculture to enhance current and future adaptations. So what can be the possible adaptation related uh, strategies in the agriculture sector? It includes climate enabling policies, improving adaptation planning and decision making, promoting science-based adaptation measures, adapt and integrated approach to improve adaptation, invest in critical infrastructure, address farmers adaptation barriers. So these are the key five, six key adoption strategies that can be adopted uh, for <laughs> agriculture sector. Uh, please accept my apology for slow movement of the slide. Shiva Sala, uh, both we are running out of time. Okay, just, just, I, I will just, I was just. Uh, yeah, you may try, try to I go to the next. Okay. Yeah. So, what now? I think what the graph that now you can see uh, on your screens, what it shows that how effective urban ecosystem based adaptations options can be. So, for Asia, you will see that on top is urban parks and green spaces for human well being. This is the top ecosystem based option available. And then second is mangrove restoration for ecosystem benefits and then urban agriculture for human well-being. Though this is with the medium contents. So, and the next row, it shows the evidence on selected adaptive option options in cities across Asia, how well they have worked out. Like the sea walls has been really effective for Shanghai and then the heat action plan in Ahmedabad, India, coastal zone regulation in Mumbai. So there are examples from where we can learn and we can uh, adopt, we can use those options and we can copy those options for uh, our country. And so what are the constraints and limits to the adaptation? And if you look at the second, second column here, the evidence is available on constraints and limits to adaptation for our sector. However, in most of the cases, the evidence is of low to medium level, except for ocean and coastal ecosystem, where we have evidence level of medium to high. So uh, in the end, I would, uh, this, this is my second last slide, and I will be briefly present here uh, for barrier solutions and adaptation options for uh, climate resilient uh, development. There are significant barriers uh, to climate change resilient development. Uh, however, some Asian countries offer solutions to overcome these barriers. On the first column, you see the barriers 
And this second column, you see the solutions, which include use of advanced technologies, improved forecasting capabilities, regional partnerships, and better risk awareness. And so similarly, we have the options available, which are climate smart agriculture, ecosystem-based DRR, and investing in blue and green infrastructure. So what are the key takeaways? This is my last slide. And uh, what are the key takeaways uh, from uh, the climate impact uh, report uh, by IPCC? That we now we all know that climate impacts are already more widespread and severe than we expected. And we are logged into even a worse impact for climate change in the near term. So these risks will escalate with the rising temperatures. And often there would be irreversible impacts of climate change inequity, conflict, and development challenges. They heighten these vulnerabilities to climate risks. So what we see is that adaptation is crucial and feasible solutions that already exist but need more support for, uh, to reach to the vulnerable communities. So climate risks, vulnerability, and adaptation barriers, they, they need to be factored into decision making across all uh, levels of governance. And thank you very much. This is all what I wanted to say. Many thanks, uh, Shabazz Saab, both shukriya. And um, we, in the interest of time, we quickly move on to the next uh, presenter, Dr. Fahim Kokar, who's the head of uh, Department and Institute of Environmental Science and Engineering in National University of Science and Technology. Um, and one of the one of the very celebrated uh, expert here uh, in the in the climate change change science. So Dr. Saab is going to be talking about adaptation measures to manage projected climate change impacts in reducing climate risks. Uh, Fahim, can I uh, request politely to uh, limit your presentation within ten minutes? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Blal, uh, for this kind introduction and I will try my level best to be more focused. And uh, do, do, uh, am I audible to the audience as well? You are absolutely audible. Okay, can I share my screen? Is my screen visible to everyone? Yes, Fahim, you are live. We can see you, we okay. can hear you. Okay. Thank you. So first of all, uh, uh, thank you for my uh, earlier speakers this, uh, this afternoon. They make my job a bit easier, so I will skip that particular information which is uh, about the impact that we are experiencing uh, in, in Asia. So I will primarily focus on what we have actually done, local studies and identify the impact. I will primarily focus on then what are actually adaptation measures and how we can go with that. So we're living in the world of expansion growth and that has toll on natural resources because we, uh, it also results in expo uh, exponential exploitation of natural resources and ultimately results in emissions of various greenhouse gases and other toxic pollutants, which has further toll on the environment and the ecosystem out there. And that's why we're experiencing this global warming and climate change impact. And we are more uh, vulnerable because of being less resilient part of the world. So uh, you are familiar with this curve, CO2 curve. So uh, in about 250 years, we have released the atmosphere around 421 ppm of CO2, which nature could have taken 600 million years to trap similar amount of CO2 at its uh, in, in, on the air. So the, this is uh, the, the sixth assessment book has a strong focus on this interaction among the coupled system. And this is the main salient, salient feature of working group to report so that it uh, discuss about the climate, human society, and ecosystem in access and provide the, uh, how the, the, these are interlinked and these interactions in, uh, are quite the basis for emerging risk, climate risk particularly. If you look at this picture over here on the left side, 
you see the impacts are either way. Climate change are also impacting human society, and human society is actually causing the climate change. And similarly, uh, the, the human society is also impacting the biodiversity as well. So, but at the same time, these interactions uh, can be managed properly and can provide an opportunity to, for a resilient, climate resilient future. But that is only possible when once we have recognition of climate risk and that can help us strengthen our adaptation and mitigation actions and transformation towards from a climate risk to climate resilient uh, development. And this climate actions requires actually backing of uh, strong governance, knowledge, capacity building, technological technology, and finances. So once we have this uh, capacity building, uh, uh, improved capacity and technological uh, adaptation, so we can and sufficient finances are there, we can actually uh, turn this climate risk development model into a uh, climate resilient model as well, which is actually mentioned over here in this, this picture. You see uh, the human society is not, can, can, can also be uh, helping restoring the ecosystem by having proper governance and finances and, and action that is actually requiring the restoration of the ecosystem. And similarly, ecosystem can, a restored ecosystem or improved ecosystem can result in a future climate which, which is more resilient to the adverse impacts and disasters. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, this uh, the, as mentioned in AR6 and 4, so these are very common uh, impacts that has been experienced across the world, and these are include heat waves, droughts, floods, and glacier melting. So we will talk about in different different sections or spheres. So for instance, ecosystem and lost habitat. Uh, for both flora and fauna, massive wildfires during heat because of heat waves, and and that this is what we're experiencing right now in Pakistan. This is quite enormous over, over the years, and uh, the grass fever had large implication, increased drought, and especially international trans uh, boundary rivers basins. They will experience what is caused in many parts of the Asia as well. It has uh, severe health implication, increasing water uh, vector borne and waterborne diseases. Change in rainfall patterns and lack of drainage system can cause bacteria in water uh, and viral infections. Energy demand will be increased because of hot climate and uh, increased water demands as well. And that has also implications for the, uh, the food sector as well because of increased floods and droughts together with heat stress will have an adverse impacts on food availability. Another aspect is climate uh, change has severe implications on cities and settlements, particularly the migration that will play a significant role in enhancing effects of climate change in urban settlements and in, in particular in the coastal cities. So let's have a look and focus on what exactly we experience in Pakistan. What you see there, this is, uh, almost uh, 40 years after the record from uh, temperature from Pakistan Meteorological Department, and it was, we calculated temperature mapping over the years. You see, after 1998, we have more prevailing uh, warming spells of uh, heat that we experienced in Pakistan, and we and 2016 being the uh, hottest recorded year with 1.2 degrees Celsius in, in since 1978. And if you look at the climate change impact, so how this has an impact on, impacted our main, main, main so, monsoon system in Pakistan, you see here, this is, uh, we use uh, satellite data and uh, PMD monitoring stations. And this is actually the baseline, the red line. And uh, sorry, uh, the gray line, dash area is the baseline area uh, for uh, the rainfall incident having 2.5 millimeter per day of rain. So if you look at for the, the study period of 2010 to 2016, we have seen a, some special shift in monsoon uh, uh, 
range and on some area more, more towards south. And similarly, if we slightly increase the rain, rainfall intensity, like four millimeter per day, so it has converged. And the, the, the very interesting point is that you see the, these these circles with minus and plus signs. These are actually meteorological department data for the respective years. And the plus signs mean they have shows increase, and the negative signs mean they have experienced a decrease. So they are quite consistent with the satellite or what the satellite have observed. This the special so in the overall uh, rainfall anomalies that we have seen. So this is like uh, the base year and the sequence uh, and the following study years. So the total rainfall and the, the yellow line is showing the total number of rainfall based on uh, this 2.5 millimeter range per day. So you see overall there is hardly any uh, uh, specific change in rainfall, there's quite huge internal variability. But one thing is very uh, determined that is actually the number of rainfalls have uh, substantially reduced. So up to 20%, 25% actually. So that means that our range are overall total rainfall is not that much altered, but the frequency of rainfall has largely decreased. And similar for the post monsoon season as well. So that means uh, the intensity of rainfall has increased, the number of rain days has increased actually, and the, the total rainfall has also increased during the post monsoon season. So that actually tells us that there have been a, a spatial shift, but also temporal shift in the occurrence of monsoon as well. But still, it is a preliminary analysis. We need a more extensive and more data. Uh, daily data for that to in order to uh, speculate on concrete basis about this temporal shift in the uh, monsoon. So what are actually the implications of, of these monsoon ch changes? We know that our agricultural system is largely caused by the monsoon system, vast irrigation system, and uh, hydroelectric power in the livestock. So yeah, so they will be largely affected. So let me tell you another aspect, which is actually causing an impact on the agriculture actually on yield. So this is another new uh, aspect of scientific research, which is uh, the air quality. So if look, look at this is WHO report, which tells uh, ranks part, uh, that published back in 2018, and Pakistan was the third most polluted country in the world. And it has, mm, so, over the years, Pakistan's air quality has been deteriorated huge. Even now, nowadays, we are ranked number one or number two. So just quickly a look. So how this, for instance, just one, like uh, ozone um, pollution is going to have impact on the staple foods like rice and wheat and also soybean and maize. So for instance, here, in, you see the South Asia uh, is, is here. And the increased losses will be higher for all these uh, food crops. Uh, there will be more clear in this. This is uh, climate change naturally benefits some plants by lengthening growing season, increasing carbon dioxide. But this is mainly primarily in the northern high latitudes, which, which are in the cold, cold region. But if you look at the Pakistan over here, so we will experience uh, severe loss, which is loss greater than the, like Pakistan lies here, having I mean, loss greater than 5% for corn, wheat, rice, and potatoes. So uh, we all experience and uh, sensitize about the climate change impacts. So because of uh, frequent heat waves, for instance, um, back in uh, 2015, there was massive heat waves and devastating impacts were there. But this year we have also uh, in part of Punjab and uh, Sindh, we have a devastating heat wave and resulting in large forest fires as well. So between 1997 and 2016, Pakistan lost an average of 523 lives per year due to climate change impacts. And uh, according to FAO, 2015 for the country presently suffered from 41.4 million undernourished people. So the frequency of heat waves in Pakistan has uh, uh, increased 
and uh, the, the deaths or casualties caused by heat waves has increased five folds in 1997. So according to PMD reports, mean annual temperature will increase by more than four, four degrees Celsius in Northern Pakistan and by around four degrees for the Southern plains of Pakistan by the end of 20, 21st century. And also we have experienced uh, vector-borne diseases for quite widespread even in the northern latitudes, especially during the 2016-17 dengue fever breakout in the northern highlands of Pakistan in Swat and Shawa districts. And so this is kind of uh, indications that there has been a transition in some part of Pakistan in northern latitudes where we the transition is from cold to the water region. So what are actually the barriers to effective uh, uh, adaptation or actions. So the, the, the first one is incompetent governance. And the other one, which is actually the major problem our topmost uh, challenge in Pakistan is inadequate evidence to prioritize action because with lack of uh, climate database, climate profile assessment, and where uh, we put more effort, so we need to have effective and climate profile in different regions of Pakistan as well. So incompetent governance is also another challenge in Pakistan. This could be because of the lack of capacity, political benefits, and lack of adequate policies, lack of law enforcement, uneven source distribution, and financial risk constraints uh, in, in the country. So what are actually the solutions? So normally uh, use of advanced technology, producing evidence for effective action, better risk awareness, uh, among the stakeholders, improve forecasting capabilities, including early warning systems and regional partnership and learning need to improve uh, to reduce the climate risk. For instance, what would be uh, the option that are available, for instance, in order to uh, reduce the climate risk for uh, agriculture sector, we can, we have to actually opt or shall opt to the climate smart agriculture which uh, can be a, uh, like a win-win situation for the farmers and also for the climate as well, because it saves revenue, it saves water, it saves uh, fertilizers, and it, it also increases the yield as well. And it will also address, uh, address the, the, the food security issue as well. So uh, artificial intelligence, the, is widely applied nowadays in climate smart agriculture techniques. Ecosystem based disaster risk reduction uh, can help uh, to manage uh, the disasters. Uh, and it's the sustainable management, conservation, and restoration of ecosystem to provide services that reduce disaster risk by mitigating hazard and by using livelihood resilience. For instance, uh, last we have a bulk of prototype, uh, which is semi automated system to predict potential blast in an HKH region. So, for the time being, we studied Hunza River Basin, and our system can predict susceptible uh, gloss in near real time. And uh, one example of uh, uh, the change in the, uh, the gloss for glacial lakes over here is presented in this picture uh, for several lakes. So we identified almost uh, 3,000 lakes uh, have been identified in, in the northern um, areas of Pakistan. And uh, in Zari Progressions, we have a different number of 300 lakes. Uh, the next adaptation measure could be that urban blue green, the increasing urban blue green infrastructure like Dr. Shavaz has already mentioned, so we should go for urban uh, forestation, improving green belt, and taking all the measures that uh, the green and blue government like uh, increase blue green infrastructure refers to the use of blue elements like rivers, canals, ponds, wetlands, uh, flood plains, water treatment facilities, and green elements such as trees, forests. But so a good combination of blue and green development that can help to re, uh, reduce the disaster risk in urban aspect. Very important aspect that is like how we turn our CPAC into green economic corridor, particularly because uh, we know that the CPAC is very vital to 
Pakistan's economy, and I used to call this his economic lifeline of Pakistan. And uh, so the thing is uh, that 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 is going through a very fragile ecosystem and glaciated region of Pakistan. So we need to uh, put effort on how we can turn CPAC into a green economic corridor. So some some uh, preliminary studies were done that we divided them into various segments and some blocks where we can put some uh, green and blue infrastructure and some uh, emissions control like CO2 arresters, uh, small gadget that has been developed at NAS that can be part of uh, any vehicle entering at the international border over here in the Iraq Gulf can be equipped and in between it can be refilled and uh, uh, can be submitted. So all the way to the water. So similar kind of action, small action can help and uh, having green blocks and afforestation and the tree lining of multiple tree lining along the CPAP can help reducing the adverse impact of this economic development corridor. Uh, yeah, so I have already mentioned this and the sustainable development. So there is no other way of, that we have to align our development goals to sustainable development goals. And that can help us to make us more resilient and towards zero hunger and uh, to get benefit in, 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 in uh, I mean, no mean uh, climate resilient uh, development in the future. So why they are important because climate change and social climate work has severe uh, in linkages because for instance, according to issue development plan, the 2010 super flood killed 1,600 people, inundated an area of 38,600 square kilometers, and caused a damages worth around $10 billion. A country like Pakistan cannot afford such uh, luxury and, and afford that much huge damages. Such events not only slow down the pace of developing countries, especially with constrained economy, extra stress on economy because of geopolitical situations in the region, just strongly demanded to implement strategies which are not only efficient, but also cost-effective as well in order to cope the impact of climate change. For instance, uh, as a, uh, the future cost of climate effect is estimated as per uh, very skeptic estimates from government of Pakistan that range from 6 billion to 14 billion uh, years. Uh, and that will be uh, required for the next 40 years, which is a huge amount. And uh, obviously the economy of Pakistan cannot afford this that much. So thank you. I'm done with this. Well, thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Fahim. Uh, very informative and, uh, and timely presentation, actually. I mean, you, you touched on all the relevant issues. Um, we already overshooted our time limits. So I would, uh, our next presenter, the last one is uh, Mr. Asif Khan, who's a water and climate change expert and an individual consultant with the Asian Development Bank. Uh, I really appreciate for people to, um, to be staying. Um, uh, even after the allocated time, uh, there are requests for uh, requests for uh, the the presentation. They are all going to be make made uh, available. They be shared with you. They be made available through our website as well. Um, so, uh, Asif Saab, very very quickly, if I can ask to conclude in about five minutes, because I want to take five minutes just for discussion as well. So please uh, be focused and. Uh, so we can uh, we can conclude in timely manner and as well as we can have a little bit of discussion as well. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, is there anyone who is uh, managing the presentation? Sir, no, you're most you can you can you can, uh, you can do it yourself. So you are being a host. You're a host now. Okay, let me share my screen. Oh, hope hope uh, this is visible to all now. This is visible, and sir, you have five minutes. My humble request. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I'll I'll try my best, and it's quite unfortunate to be the last part spent uh, to present. Uh, so uh, very quickly, um, 
uh, my background is already shared with uh, in the first slide, and I'm going to talk about the climate change impacts on floods in Pakistan, and uh, of course, like uh, not only adaptation, but the the current uh, presentation is uh, asking about the adaptation is a way forward. Uh, this is uh, my academic background and affiliations with different research in institutes. What I'll be talking about, about the global problems and then end of space and then, uh, then uh, I'll, I'll straight go to the flood projections uh, because uh, we have already talked uh, a lot about the IPCC fi findings and the adverse impacts, et cetera, et cetera, and the, the, the uh, way forward by all the participants. So, uh, of course, like uh, the global challenges, one of the main challenges is population growth. So we, we need more uh, water supply, food production, energy production, flood and drought mitigation, mayors, urbanization, and industrial development due to increase in population uh, and their demand. On the other hand, uh, we are facing the uh, uh, climate change and global warming where we are going to face um, more glacial retreat, severe floods, droughts, water scarcity, slope instability, glacial lake outburst floods, reservoir sedimentations, and forest fires, etc. So these are main challenges. Uh, somehow these are quite critical to, to be studied because uh, different impacts have uh, different end results. So uh, um, based on those, one can see that uh, the end of space is quite, quite critical to such impacts because uh, we have uh, these three mountain ranges, Hindu Kush, Karakuram, and Himalayas, uh, where from all of our rivers and main water sources are coming. So if you look into uh, a, a little bit of more detail that why uh, this climate change is quite critical for Pakistan. Uh, so what is happening like the Asian temperature rise is greater than the world's average. So even like the special report of IPCC, 1.5 degrees Celsius or two degrees Celsius, uh, still we'll have more temperature rise. Uh, we'll have more temperature rise in, 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 in Pakistan and uh, particularly in our Northern areas. Similarly, like uh, the, the uh, expected rise uh, in HKH region also remained quite higher than the, the projected one. Similarly, we have a lot of, lot of glaciers uh, uh, in, in our uh, Northern area. So those are also quite um, uh, critical for our water sources, for gloves and uh, for our uh, floods. Uh, and and uh, uh, overall, those are having uh, a, a total volume of 12,000 cubic kilometer of water. Uh, the signals of climate change are quite uh, unique in, in this region, like the Hindu Kush and Himalayas are showing negative mass balance, whereas the central Karakuram, where K2 is, the, the signals are positive or slightly negative. Uh, why? It, it will be causing problem because uh, if temperature rises there, so what will happen? We are going to have like impact on our more than 60 to 80 percent of stream flows. Similarly, the 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 uh, already available uh, glacial lakes uh, may uh, trigger the glacial lake outburst floods and so on. And of course, like this Pakistan-China economic corridor and such infrastructure will be on the stake. Um, somehow, if, if floods are there, then of course, like uh, um, we, we will not be able to store the, the water because the storage capacity in Pakistan, our indus basin is only 10%. Uh, looking into the results, for example, like the extreme left corner and uh, the, the uh, right bottom corner is showing us the results of precipitation changes uh, in uh, uh, based on uh, CMIP 6 data uh, for SSP 245 and SSP 585 scenarios. And we, one can see that um, most of our um, hilly terrain foothills of Himalayas are going to receive more precipitation during these uh, projected periods of 20, uh, 2011 to 2100. Similar is the, is the case for the extreme scenario, which is uh, uh, SSP 585. If we look at the 
temperaturized, then we can clearly see that the maximum temperature and minimum temperature is going to rise up to three Celsius degrees centigrade based on its speed 245, whereas around six degrees Celsius based on uh, SSP 585. So what will happen that like, there will be more um, um, melt uh, from snow and glacier. And of course, like uh, there is also expected increase in precipitation, both will trigger the glacial lake outburst floods and both will trigger riverine floods, both will um, also have a negative impact on, on the urban flooding and uh, 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 and reserves will, will, will go down to our coastal areas. Um, if we look at a few of the modeling reserves for the upper end space and a few of the major river basins, for example, for Jhelum, uh, we can see that, uh, uh, that uh, the flow variability during various months, seasons, and annual, um, annual basis, those are not quite significant. But if we talk about the floods, uh, we can see like the, the lower line is based on, on the historical period uh, and the, the higher lines are uh, the flood frequency lines for, for the future projected. So what these are showing us that uh, one in thousand year flood will, will become even like a, a less than 100 year flood. Which is which is quite uh, quite alarming, and um, similar is, is the case for for other uh, river basins like for Chinab and for Kabul River Basin. Uh, so what will happen? Like if if it is going to happen, then of course we have to talk about and we have to think about the the, the adaptation and mitigation measures. Um, and what will happen? Like uh, of course, like the future projections of precipitation is showing. Uh, 25 to 40 percent increase based on two scenarios and uh, ensemble models and the future maximum and minimum temperature rise is, is going to be three to 6.5 degrees Celsius based on SSP 4, uh, 245 and 585 scenarios. Uh, these will uh, trigger a more glove events. These will also have like the the impact on, on floods, whether it's going to be like the urban floods, whether it's going to be the riverine flood, whether it's going to be clough events. So all of these uh, events are going to happen in near to far future. So what we need actually, we need more climate change research, we need more assessment and studies in this field. And of course we need to have climate inclusive flood modeling and protection. For example, afforestation can also play a wider role in, in controlling those floods and monitoring can, can let us know that how uh, glacial lakes are growing, how critical areas are there, for example, which infrastructure is at stake and um, how much uh, coastal degradation is happening with passage of FAM, how much mangroves do we need to, to stop the the, the seawater intrusion uh, due to uh, due to rising uh, in in sea, for example. So this is the way forward for us that uh, we have to do further analysis and research. And based on those, we need to have climate inclusive flood protection plan. Like we have national flood protection plan four, uh, but that is not climate inclusive. Now, we should, for NDRMF and for other stakeholders, what we should do, we should have climate inclusive national flood protection plan and um, similarly adaptation and mitigation measures to cater for the future climate in, uh, inclusiveness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asif Saab. And um, thank you, everyone. To for uh, all the all the speakers for their excellent presentations and um, uh, sharing uh, some of the latest research ideas from their their domains. So we heard a lot. We you know we we move from a very hardcore science from IPCC findings and the different scenarios, which basically project us from 1.2 degrees to two degrees centigrade uh, for sure. But it can overshoot uh, more than that. And then 
uh, coming down to the adaptation measures which are required for uh, specifically for Pakistan. I know we have already overshooted our time limit and I really, really appreciate and thank you all of you for, uh, for staying on. But I want to take just uh, um, three or four or five minutes just to uh, get some feeling from the floor from all the participants. Maybe we can take, uh, we can take um, uh, one or two questions and uh, that of course is going to be helpful. Before that, just want to announce uh, once again, all the presentations are going to be shared and uh, the event uh, is uh, already going live on our uh, Facebook and uh, even the recording is going to be starting uh, uh, shared, shared as well. So um, just two questions before we move to the, to the closing. Unmute everyone. Hmm? And, uh, Please unmute yourself before speaking. Yes, please uh, introduce yourself first. Assalamualaikum, everyone. My name is Tamid Iftikhar, and I'm of A levels. Um, I just came back from the US after completing a, a YES program. Um, and then I have noticed that I live in Islamabad. So I've noticed that uh, when I left a year ago, it was very like there was not much air pollution in Islamabad, but now there's like when I came back, uh, I could not see the Margala Hills because of a lot of air pollution. So uh, my question is, as, as, as the youth of Pakistan, what, what can I do um, at, at such a smaller level to reduce uh, air pollution and to put, put my part um, in reducing air pollution? Okay, very important question and very pertinent one. Um, any, uh, let me collect one or two more questions and I'll ask my other presenters to, to intervene. So any further question from anyone? Ji, uh, this is Dr. Amakul from the Center for Disaster Management, UMD Lahore. Uh, I have a comment and a quick question. Uh, the comment is uh, related to Fahad uh, presentation. Uh, while, um, well, he said um, I, IPCC prepares summary for policymakers. Uh, but at the same time, uh, IPCC remains policy neutral. So, which is to say, it is policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. It doesn't prescribe any policy. Uh, and the question is uh, related to um, this, uh, related to the discussions. I wasn't really aware of the full breadth of the topics, but considering the worthy panel and the host agency, I'd like to discuss how we are moving forward towards embedding disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation in our development process and integrating it with the different department functions and vertical tiers of the government. And regarding the GCF, the loss and damage facility, how can we access this facility and how can the government, the concerned government departments facilitate that? So yeah, thank you so much. Okay, one May more I question. Yeah, one I will also. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, my question from uh, Fahad. Now, he talked about the limits to what adaptation can achieve. Uh, in the report, the most detailed picture of the future adaptation limits was divided low, medium, and high, and Latin America ranked the highest in comparison to other region. Uh, can uh, he please comment that why this region uh, is showing higher rank as compared to others? Okay, thank you very much. So we have- May a... I have a last question? Sorry, please. Well, also, if I, could, if yeah. I may have- yeah, Sorry, this yourself. is- so, so, thank you very much. This is Irfan, um, Irfan Tariq. I am uh, uh, Vice Chair of Working Group 1 of ER6, and I, I also had the privilege of representing Asia Pacific and UNFCC Bureau. Uh, Bilal Sab, if you allow me, uh, uh, I would first of all like to congratulate NDMRF for hosting this event. I think this is the first time that NDRMF has initiated some professional uh, outreach activity. Second, I also wanted to share the experience we had in AR5. You know, uh, after AR5 uh, in 2013, uh, we prepared a, a downloaded, downscaled the AR5 um, uh, findings to the national level and prepared guidelines for spe specific uh, one of the uh, major disasters. Oh, we 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 so, we 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 
for the ER5 cycle, we were able to downscale the, the findings of the last assessment report to the national level and develop guidelines for addressing issues like heat wave and structure them for uh, uh, incompatibility with each uh, stakeholder's mandate. Uh, I think th this was an extremely successful initiative. And now that we have got much more higher level of understanding of AR6, um, my uh, uh, question come proposal would be to develop, because Pakistan is a, a, a multi ecosystem uh, country, um, it would be extremely useful if we develop uh, scenario-based projections for each ecological system and NDMR, taking benefit of NDMRF, project, not only to projectize them, but to align them with our development strategy. I, I think we can, uh, we can climate proof our ne next PSDP and uh, the five-year development plan in line with uh, whatever the findings of IPCC science are. So my suggestion would be preparing scenario-based um, uh, projections uh, for e each ecological system. Uh, and I think GCISC has got very relevant uh, professionals to do that. And NDRMF to develop and link them with our um, uh, uh, development strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irfan Saab. Uh, your points are very well noted and taken, and we, we have a very good collaboration actually coming up and emerging with GCISC and a number of other, other uh, partners uh, um, in the country and out of the country as well. But uh, your point is very well taken, and we're definitely going to internalize it and take this into consideration. Um, there were two or three questions from uh, for Fahad. I don't know if Fahad is still online, and um, because he had to go to... Yeah, to sh yeah to, okay uh, otherwise uh, we'll uh, otherwise we'll, we'll we'll get some response from Fahad and uh, you know we'll uh, we'll include in a in a short brief report of this event and we'll share with all the all the participants uh, a very pertinent and a very important question from our young um, participants Sorry. The speaker can also uh, comment on this question, even if the father is not available. Yeah, any, uh, anyone from the participants who wants to comment uh, on the question? Uh, please, please repeat the question and I'll be able to answer, sorry. Sorry, Asif, did you say something? Uh, I said that, can you repeat his question and I'll, I'll be able to respond accordingly. Yeah. Yeah, no, Dr. Asif, I'm going to defeat. Uh, Dr. Shaukat here from GCIC. Uh, I'm, I'm asking the adaptation limit that can achieve. In the report, it was mentioned that there is low, medium, and high categories of different countries, and North America and Latin America was ranked at highest. So uh, I was asking about the uh, comparison of the region that. Uh, uh, can you please comment that uh, uh, what is the process that uh, they select this uh, North America at ranking highest as a uh, in the limitation of uh, adaptation that can achieve? Like Fahad mentioned that it's 1.5 limit is the best uh, adaptation uh, like uh, target. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anand Shokas. Um... Uh, to me, like uh, as per my understanding, like the uh, of course, like uh, one of the basic uh, thing for adaptation is uh, the the availability of funds and uh, planning of of the the adaptation mayor. So so uh, of course, like the 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 US and other developed countries have uh, uh, much uh, uh, better financial resources to to cope with with, with the ongoing climate challenges. Hope this answers your question. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I, I see that I see that many many hands are up for uh, further questions, but I'm afraid that we do not have uh, enough time. Um, as for Hussain Saab, Dr. Njum Rashid, um, you know, just pop your questions. We're going to we're going to have uh, 
um, another session of interactive session, something like this very soon. Um, just to announce before I ask uh, the ask for the closing remarks from uh, Mr. Asad Hayauddin, who is the Secretary for Economic Affairs Division. And um, uh, just, to do, just to highlight that we have uh, four more sub uh, webinars coming up. And uh, it, was a, it is a series of five webinars. This was the very first one. Thank you very much. We got an overwhelming response actually, exceeded our limited, to, limited uh, our capacity to accept participants. And uh, so a lesson learned is that uh, we have to look into the, to exceed our limits and uh, uh, allowing uh, the highest number or higher number of participants to, to, to participate in this session, in these sessions for the future, future webinars. Video. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, do we have a Audio sub? Copy, Video girl, really. Video girl. What's the sub, huh? Can you hear us? Yeah, uh, Asa Saab, kindly please your closing remarks. Can you hear us? We've yes, yes. Uh, we can hear you. Formally express my appreciation to the speakers. My, my deepest gratitude goes to the National Disaster Risk Management Fund for organizing this event on analyzing the findings in the report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 2022. The key findings of the IPCC report suggest how climate change is adversely impacting our life and what climate change threats our regions face, since we are set to pass 1.5 degrees centigrade threshold by 2040. Increasing concentration of greenhouse gases, the global average surface temperature is continuing to rise with serious and irreversible threats and challenges. As human beings, we are the main drivers of climate change. There'll be a time when all disasters related to climate change will be labeled as man-made disasters. Pakistan being amongst the top 10 vulnerable countries, uh, this webinar is the ideal was the changing climate and we are here to sound the alarm bells. This is where we need to work on a war footing before we reach the irreversible tripping points. Our actions towards green recovery by enhancing our protected areas, energy transition from thermal to clean and green energy. And we also need to work on additional nature-based organic solutions. This definitely requires further hard and smart work on the part of the government, civil society, and the private sector, as well as intellectual, financial, and human resources to fulfill and meet our targets. It's essential for us to catalyze and leverage efforts to achieve a scale that matches the magnitude of the challenges we face. Finally, I would like to convey my gratitude to the CEO, NDRMF, and his team for organizing this webinar. And I look forward to hearing success stories when we meet our global climate change targets by the actions we undertake. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, kind remarks. And um, thank you very much to all the participants. Uh, keep watching out our LinkedIn page, our Twitter page, and uh, for more updates. So the next webinar is going to be on disaster risk financing, and that is going to be held on 1st of July. Uh, we'll be sending the invites, we'll be sending uh, all the relevant uh, material. And uh, once again, many, many thanks for your uh, very active participation, and of course, uh, for staying along uh, beyond, the, beyond the time. Thank you, have a wonderful day. Thank you very much.